Welcome, my name is Abby, and I'm just one of many of our pastors and staff who are so grateful that you are here with us today. But we're not just here for you on Sundays. In fact, if there's any way that we can pray for you or help get you connected, we have links in our descriptions for you to do just that. Now today, we're gonna to be jumping into our brand new series, Bold Prayers, where Pastor Adam's gonna share with us four ways we can grow in our prayer life. We have great worship in store for you, so let's go ahead and jump right in. Good morning, New Hope! Let's stand and worship in the house of the Lord. And if you're joining us online, welcome. Come on. When fear has fallen, when fear is common, and you're still calling me. When faith is lost and my hope exhausted, you will be my strength. When my mind says,
just where I started How you brought me out It's been a long road walking Filled with ups and downs But you taught me how to be strong How to put my armor on Wrote the word upon my heart And set me free But now I'm walking in the light Cause your love is burning and I'm not gonna hide, no Cause this joy is for the world to see Cause you're rewriting my story I'm a testimony So far from where I used to be I'm walking in the light Oh, cause your love is burning in me I'm a new creation There's no fear in me Cause I got Fountain to the well that's never dry. Put your hope in living water that satisfies. Come on, y'all. Come on, walk with me to the fountain. To the well that's never dry. Put your hope in living water that satisfies. Come on, walk with me to the fountain. To the well that's never dry. Put your hope in It is going to be awesome. All right, so make sure that's on your calendar, October 18th. That's on a Wednesday night. We're going to have a night of worship. There's going to be a live recording of the evening. Our worship team is going to be singing all these amazing songs that they've been writing, and you do not want to miss out. So we got a lot of details that we'll be giving you between now and then. Uh, but at the end of our service today, our worship team is going to sing uh, one of the songs of uh, for this house, that is literally what the live recording is gonna be entitled. So you're gonna to to hear that today, and it's gonna be awesome, and we cannot wait for that. Hey, if you're new, if it's your first time, welcome. We're honored you're here. My name's Adam. I serve as a senior pastor. My wife, Morgan, and I will be in the lobby after this service. We would love to 
to meet you, uh, put some names with some faces, and we are so honored you're here with us today. We are kicking off a brand new series today called Bold Prayers. Been looking forward to this for quite some time. Uh, just let, let you know, uh, last series, those of you who call a New Hope Home, we were partaking, participating in communion um, every single week in that series. And this series, we're not gonna do it every week, we're gonna do it some of the weeks. And so our guest services team, they always do such a fantastic job. They'll make sure they hook you up with the communion elements on those Sundays that we'll be uh, receiving communion as a church family. So be on the lookout for that. But we are kicking off this brand new series, super excited about it. Let me tell you where we're gonna start. We're gonna be in this for a month, but the title of today's series is Getting Started in praying bold prayers. So let me just say this up top. If this prayer is something you struggle with, if it's a little intimidating, that's okay. It's a pretty normal thing. Prayer can be intimidating. Prayer can be something that we have difficulty with from time to time. And so before we kind of jump in with both feet and, and kind of start praying some bold prayers, I wanna make sure that there's some, some things that we don't miss that could be very easy to miss on our journey to praying these bold prayers. And so I'm gonna encourage you to take some notes, not just today, but in this entire series. Uh, you might be old school like me and like to write things down. You might wanna type some things out on your phone, but we can take notes and that way it makes it a little more easy for us to act actually put it in to practice. And I do have some things I'm gonna share with you today, kind of some practical steps to take. But before we get to those, I wanna just to take a second and I wanna lay a foundation, not just for today, but for the entirety of this series. Because I think it's helpful to ask the question, why is it that we're supposed to pray bold prayers? I got three reasons I wanna share with you. We'll circle back around to these over and over in this series. So the first reason that we pray bold prayers is that they demonstrate big faith. Now, here's why that matters. Hebrews 11:6 says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. The faith is actually part of what it means to walk with God, and that when we pray bold prayers, it's how we put our big faith into practice. Ephesians 3:20 says this: God is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. Now, here's what's interesting about that verse. It assumes that we are asking and imagining great things of God. So here's my question. When was the last time you did that? When was the last time you caught yourself daydreaming, imagining about all the great things God could do in your life? And here's what God says. Hey, I wanna do that, and I actually wanna do immeasurably more. But see, when we begin to pray these types of prayers, it's how we put our faith and to practice. Let me give you the second reason that praying bold prayers is so important. Bold prayers build dependency on God. I thought Abby did such a great job last week talking about dependency. Did Abby do a great job last week? Let's give it up for Abby. Fantastic. It's so big that we see that. Now, why does dependency on God matter? Well, see, the more dependent you are on God, the more supernatural strength you receive from God. See, some of you are wondering where God is. I don't see God doing anything in my life. I don't see any supernatural activity in my life. It might be because you got it good. You got it figured out. You got it all together. You don't necessarily need God. You say, Pastor, I would never say that, but you're living that way. Wow. See, if you're living a life where you're just kind of getting it all together on your own, got it all kind of figured out, you haven't embraced dependency, which is totally different than what we're told to do. We're told to be independent, you got it all figured out. Here's what God says, get dependent on me, yeah. to experience me, to experience the supernatural activity that I'd like to bring into your life. And here's the thing, when we pray bold prayers, this is how we literally say, God, I am dependent upon you. That if you don't come through with what I'm asking you to do, God, I don't know how I'm going to make it. God is looking for our dependency and bold prayers is one of the ways that we show him. Finally, why does praying bold prayers matter? Bold prayers are connected to God's intervention, both in our world and in our lives. See, sometimes when Christians start talking about prayer, they just start arguing. They, they, get, they get a little, maybe they've been in Sunday school a little too long, right? They get a little too theological. And they say things like, I just don't understand why we should pray. I mean, if God's already figured it all out, I mean, if God already knows what's gonna happen in the future, why am I supposed to pray? And why am I supposed to ask him? And, I, and they just wanna sit around and argue and they wanna debate. And let me just tell you up top, this is not that series, okay? We're not gonna do that in this series. We're gonna be really comfortable that sometimes when we talk about God, here's the thing, there's a little bit of mystery. 
In fact, step on your toes already. Week one, here we go, right? If you can explain everything about God, I'm not so sure you're reading about the God that scripture tells us about. So is God in control? Sure he is. Is God sovereign? Absolutely. Does God already know what's gonna happen? Of course. Are we supposed to pray and ask him to move? Yes. How do those things work together? You figure that out, you get to teach next week. That's how it goes, all right? That's how it goes. So we're just gonna be real comfortable in this series. That yes, God knows, but he also calls upon us to ask. And I don't know about y'all, but our world could use a little bit more of God's supernatural intervention. So we call on him. Some of you could use God intervening into your circumstances. So we call on him. And bold prayers are how we go about doing this. Let me tell you what we're gonna do in this series. We're gonna be in this for a month. Let me kind of give you a little bit of a preview of what we're gonna be talking about. So next Sunday, we're gonna look at the bold prayer of Jabez. And then we're gonna look at the bold prayer of Joshua. Hope you're really picking up on the theme here, a little Old Testament theme. Three weeks, bold prayer of Hannah. She's Samuel's mother, Samuel the prophet, who anointed David to be the king. And then we're gonna wrap up this series on Sunday, October 8th, with stories of God answering bold prayers with Pastor Ezekiel. He's gonna be here in the house on that day. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, if you're new to New Hope, Pastor Ezekiel pastors a church in the Dominican Republic that we partner with. We had a couple of teams go there in the month of August, and um, you do not want to miss that day. We're going to sit up here, and uh, we're just going to talk, the two of us, and I'm going to ask him questions. Hey, how have you seen God answer some of your bold prayers? And then I'm going to start writing down what he says, and I'm going to encourage you to do the same. It's going to be an incredible Sunday. It's also going to be an incredible series. I think God wants to stretch your prayer life. I think God wants to stretch our prayer life, church, and the life of our entire church. So let me challenge you unapologetically, week one, to be a part of this series. Now, how can you do that? Well, first of all, you can do that by being here, okay? You can be on our campus every single Sunday. I wanna encourage you to do that. If you can't be on our campus, you can join us online. And look, we are a church family. We are one family, whether we're online or whether we are on campus. But we're also gonna add something new starting in this series and now moving forward. See, previous to today, if you missed the service on campus, if you missed the service with a live broadcast, you could catch the sermon later in the week. Well, now what you're going to be able to do is not just catch the sermon later in the week, but catch the entirety of the service, including our worship and the sermon, all right? So that's really good news. So... I wanna say thank you to our production team and they figure out how to do all of that and do a great job. Yeah, give it up for the production team. <laughs> so, th so, so here's the thing. You, you can come on campus, you can join us online live, or if you miss both of those, then you can go to our YouTube channel and you can watch the service whenever it's convenient for you. Here's what I'm telling you right now. You do not have an excuse. Don't tell me I missed that week. Right? That's on you, not us, all right? So we want you to be a part of this because I think God wants to do something great in your life, okay? And I think prayer is gonna be one of the main ways that he goes about doing it. Before today, let's get started, all right? How do you actually begin to do that? It's like, what are some steps I'm supposed to take? So today's message is a how-to message. Like, how do I actually get started in praying bold prayers? What are some steps I need to take if prayer is something that I struggle with? What are some steps I need to be reminded of, even if I've been praying for a long time, but my prayer life has gotten into a little bit of a rut? So I want to share with you four practical steps all of us can take, and it's going to help us get started in praying bold prayers. So if you're taking notes today, let me give you the first one. First step, okay? Recognize that my worry is an opportunity to pray. I want you to see worry as an opportunity. So I've been, you know, asked a lot of times over the years, you know, pastor, how do I pray? Or I really have a difficult time praying or I don't really know how to pray. And so when someone says to me, I don't know how to pray, I always respond the same way. And I say it with love because, you know, I'm not trying to be, you know, smart aleck or a jerk or anything like that, but I am trying to kind of get the conversation going. So if someone says to me, I don't know how to pray, I always ask them, do you know how to worry? No one's ever said no. It's amazing, right? Like, yeah, I got that one down. I'm like, awesome. So if you know how to worry, you can learn how to pray because worries are just prayers we say to ourselves. Worries are just the thoughts that stay in our own mind that we never verbalize to God. 
See, the moment you take something that you are worried about and you actually tell it to God, believe it or not, that's actually prayer. Sometimes we make prayer a little more difficult than it is. So, so in this series, I don't want you to worry more, but I do want you to see worry as an opportunity. Now, where do we get guidance from God's word in this truth? It's from Philippians 4, 6, okay? Do not be anxious about anything. Now, that word anything, that's a big word, right? So I wanted to know, what does that word anything mean in the original Greek? And so I looked it up, and the word anything in the original Greek means anything. So we actually... <laughs> We don't get a way out on this one. I'm sorry, all right? It really means that. So don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, petition means you're asking. So by prayer and petition, through your asking with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. I love that this verse assumes anxiety. That's, that's encouraging to me. Paul assumes anxiety. He's the author of this letter. Hey, you're gonna be anxious, but when you're anxious, be reminded to not be anxious, but to take that and actually present it as a request to God. So when you verbalize your worry, when you talk about what's making you feel anxious to God, that's actually communicating with God, which is prayer. And look at the promise of this passage as it continues in verse seven. When we do this, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, confession time with the pastor. Let me tell you what I usually want from God when I'm feeling anxious. Let me tell you what I usually want from God when I'm worried. I want a little bit of clarity. I want an answer. I want some direction. But do you know what God's word says I need more than clarity, answers, or direction? His word says that I actually need a peace that transcends my own understanding. I prefer answers that I can understand. God says, you don't need that. You need a peace that's greater than your own human understanding. And see, that peace will transcend your human understanding and that peace will guard your heart and your mind. See, church, when we take to God what we're worried about and what we are feeling anxious about as our prayers, the promise is that we receive God's peace. So if you're looking for God's peace in your life, might I encourage you to begin to see your worries as an opportunity and start talking to God about them in prayer. Let me give you the second, second practice. Like how do I get started praying these bold prayers? Start and or keep telling God how great he is. And I wanted to put both in there because for some of you, this is a regular practice. You, you tell God how great he is. In your own prayer life, you tell God how great he is through worship for others of us, this is a habit we need to get into. And you say, well, I thought we were talking about prayer. You just mentioned worship. But a lot of time, those things cross over. In the book of Psalms, you'll see David writing out these psalms that are prayers that are being song, sung as songs in the temple. That sometimes when we're worshiping in here together, we're worshiping, but the words that we are worshiping with are actually being sung to God as prayers. And so, so God loves for us to tell him how big he is. Let me give you three passages from scripture that do this. I just picked out three this week. I love these. Psalm 96, four. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. See, sometimes you don't know what to pray. Just read God's word. First Chronicles 29, 11. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all. Isaiah 40, 26. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. We just sang about that in our worship this morning. Our worship team led us in an incredible way. And, and, and the song we sang talked about the stars. Like if you're having a hard time remembering how big God is, go outside at night and look up. All right, that's what this is saying, that he calls them forth by name. And then listen to this, I love this, this is awesome. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. God has never lost a star, that should encourage you, okay? <laughs> that if God's never lost a star, your life is good, you're fine, you're just you. Those are stars, they're big, they're on fire, they burn, all right? He's never lost one, that's how big God is. See. God loves it when we start telling him how big he is, how wonderful he is, how great he is. He loves to hear that from us. He receives that from us. But listen to me, he doesn't need it. 
God doesn't struggle with insecurity, okay? He doesn't have an identity complex. God is not sitting up there in heaven going, I wish they would just tell me how great I am. He is not doing that. He's not, okay? So when we tell God how great he is, it's not so that he can be reminded of how great he is, it's so that we can be reminded of how great he is. Something happens in your heart when you verbalize with your words to God how great he is, how big he is. It reminds us that the God we're talking to is the God who created those stars, the God who named those stars, the God who has never misplaced one of those stars. And let me just say this for free. This isn't really tied to this series, but perhaps it is, okay? I think the number one thing Christians struggle with, you may see this differently and that's totally cool. I'd love to have a conversation with you in the lobby after the service, but this is, this is a belief of mine. I think the number one thing that Christians struggle with is too small of a view of God. They say, well, I struggle in my prayer life. Maybe not. Maybe you struggle with too small of a view of God. And if you had a bigger view of God, I bet you talk to him more. See, as long as your view of God remains small, you're not gonna talk to him about what's going on in your life because your view of God has limited him to someone or something that can't do anything about your circumstances. But the God I read about in scripture, he names stars. He doesn't lose stars. He speaks things into creation. And oh, by the way, he created you in his own image. But if you go through life looking at your problems, your challenges, your issues, and you see them as bigger than a God, perhaps you're projecting onto God a view and a perspective that isn't his. It's yours. So let's mess with that a little bit. How do you start to build this practice of telling God how big he is, telling God how great he is through a prayer life? Well, well you know, you can, you can get stuck in a rut. So I'm just gonna throw out some things. Right? Hopefully this is helpful. If, if it is, use it. If it's not, don't. But sometimes I get stuck in a rut too. And, and sometimes I begin to see life's challenges and problems as bigger than they really are. And, and I kind of have to go back to this. This is a practice. I think I first learned this as a high school student or college student from Louis Giglio. I can't remember all the details, but I didn't come up with this on my own. But it's been super helpful over the years. You just use the alphabet. Most people know the alphabet, right? So you use the alphabet to tell God how great he is, okay? So you just start. So God, with each letter, God, you are awesome. That's an, that's an easy one, okay? Uh, God, I believe, let's see if I can do this, that you sent Jesus to save us. God, I confess that there's no God beside you. Uh, God, the dreams you have for me are bigger than dreams I could ever have for myself. God, you are from everlasting to everlasting. God, you are faithful. God, you are great. God, you reside in the heavenlies. You see what I'm doing here, right? You just keep going with each letter. You can write this down. You can verbalize this. Now, when you get to Q, it's gonna slow down. I'm just gonna tell you right now, okay? <laughs> Gets a little challenging, all right? So Z can be kind of hard as well. X is probably the most difficult one, but that's neither here nor there. The point is it kind of gets it going, right? You just need to tell God how great he is. So use some things that you already know, like the alphabet. And then sometimes it's helpful to, to shift your mindset when it comes to talking to God. Most of us don't really think God wants to hear from us. I mean, he's got some pretty big things to deal with going on around the world. And, and hearing from us, we think that's not really high on his radar. But you've got to remember that, that he's your heavenly father. And sometimes that can be hard. Maybe you don't have a good relationship or you didn't have a good relationship with your earthly father, might I challenge you not to project that onto God as your heavenly father, but he is your heavenly father. So let me see if I can give you a little illustration to help with this. So our boys, they all have birthdays in the fall. So after this fall, they'll be 14, 12, and eight. So we're kind of out of the preschool stage, kind of the toddler stage, you know, two, three, four-year-old stage. So which incidentally, if you have kids that are, that are preschoolers or they're toddlers right now, I'm just gonna encourage you right now, hang in there, it gets better. I right? just hang in there, all right? Just hang in there. I mean, when we were, when our kids were little, like that age, we would be out in public and people would come up to us and they'd be like, oh, we just wish we could go back. I was, I was like, here, you can go back right now. I will give you this child. <laughs> the next 24 hours, they are yours, all right? You call me at 2 a.m. and you tell me if you wish you could go back, all right? So uh, it's like, what are we talking about, right? I had a buddy of mine tell me one time when they were little, he's like, you do know that one day you'll tell them, hey guys, you know, go take a shower and they'll all go take a shower and you won't have to bathe them anymore. I said, impossible. That day will never come. It came, all right? So like it does get better, right? But when they were little, two, three, four years old, a common thing that would happen 
either from church, maybe they'd you know, been in church, they'd done this in, the, in their little class at church or at school, a little preschool, whatever, is that they would color things for me. Like they would color things. You know, they get a little worksheet, they color on it. You know, somebody helps them write dad, the D's backwards, but you know, they kind of write it, right? Or they paint it with their little finger paint or whatever. And they bring them to me. This was a very common occurrence. Like on a Sunday, they would stop me and they would give it to me or they'd come home from school and you know, we'd get out of their backpack and there would be another coloring, another drawing. And I've got to tell you, 100% of them were absolutely terrible. <laughs> they were just awful. I mean, like the trees were purple, you know, the, 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 the animals were yellow, the, the, the colors didn't make sense, they, they, they never stayed inside the line, and, and, and they just had zero artistic value. But I took every single one of those and I hung them up on my wall in my office. Because see, they weren't giving them to me for their artistic value, they were giving them to me as one of my children. And I never once sat one of them down and said, Jacob, if you don't improve your coloring, you have no future. I mean, I never once did that, right? <laughs> Life is not gonna work out for you, son. Like, I never said that to him. I did not correct them, right? Because their little hearts were just expressing on some level a love that they had for their father. And I proudly displayed them in my office so that every time somebody came in, I could talk about them. Might I suggest for a moment that for those of you who struggle with prayer, you need to begin to see your prayers as a painting for your heavenly father. He's not gonna critique you. He's not gonna judge them. He's not gonna wonder when you start praying with more faith. He will take your prayers and he will hang them up on his wall because he loves you. And there's never been anyone like you. You're the only person who can create that painting for your heavenly father. So, so don't, don't try to figure out how to do it right. Just do it. Just talk to him and know that your loving heavenly father, he receives every single one of your prayers the same way that a loving father receives the paintings from his child. Number three, so how do I do this? I gotta get better. I wanna pray these bold prayers. Give me some steps here. Number three, this one's fun. Experiment to find the best way that you connect with God. I just told you God created all of us uniquely and wonderfully. There's never been anyone like you. So there are principles of prayer that are common to all of us, but there are practices of prayer that will be unique to you. And I wanna give you some permission in this series. I, I wanna free you up a little bit. I, I wanna encourage you to experiment a little bit with how you go about praying. So let me give you a verse that's a really fun verse that for a lot of Christians I think becomes a, a verse that they feel kind of held captive by, but that's not really the heart of the verse. First Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Is so I supposed to pray all the time? Like what does that mean? It means that you have an attitude of prayer. It means that prayer is the first thing that comes to mind. It means that in your day-to-day -day rhythms, prayer is a part of your life. That prayer isn't this segmented religious routine that you do that then has nothing to do with how you actually go about living your life, that you pray without ceasing. And so prayer can happen a number of different ways. Like for some of you, maybe a little routine would be helpful. Maybe you could use a new system. Maybe you need to pray in the morning or pray in the middle of the day or pray in the evening. So sometimes that's helpful. But then for others of you, you might need to be a little bit more sporadic in your prayer life. Maybe you're a little too set in a routine. Might I encourage you to incorporate what I call sentence prayers. You just pray sentence prayers throughout the day. Now, if you say them out loud, you'll get some weird looks, but that's okay, all right? Because I'm talking to God. What's your problem? That's all you have to say, all right? Well, maybe not say it that way, but anyways, let's talk about that. You can pray while you're driving. Just keep your eyes open, all right? It's the little things. Pray in the shower. Pray when you're around people. Pray when you're by yourself. Something pops in your mind. Pray about it. A person pops in your mind. Pray for that person. Incorporate prayer into everything that you do. Give yourself permission to try some new things. Think about any good relationship, okay? Think about any romantic relationship. Now, if you're married... I hope that your spouse just popped in your mind, all right? So that's, that's good. So if you're in a romantic relationship, what, what's important in that? Communication. And there's lots of different ways to communicate. I mean, you can text and you could call. You could email, maybe. I don't know if that's real romantic, right? You could handwrite something. That's super romantic. Or you could, you could do like a date night, you know, where, where you sit down and you actually talk without being interrupted. You could do like a getaway weekend. Like there's a lot of different things you can do to cultivate a romantic relationship so the two people love each other, right? So if you think about that, 
what if in that relationship, like I'll just use my wife and I, for example, like what if I just went to Morgan this afternoon and said, hey, babe, I've been thinking about this and all the different ways we communicate. Like from now on, like I just like for it to be texting, which would never happen because I talk way too much. But like just for a second, if I just said, we're only gonna communicate one way, she'd say, what are we talking about? Like that, that's not gonna help us in our relationship. So the idea there is don't do that to God. Think of a number of different ways you can communicate when you talk to God and a number of different places. Maybe you need to start praying outside. Maybe some of you need to pray inside. Maybe you need to go on a walk. Maybe you need to go on a run. Maybe, maybe you need to keep your eyes open. Maybe you need to keep your eyes closed. See, what I'm trying to help you see is there's a number of different ways to pray and you've just got to give yourself permission to experiment. And then let me tell you this, this is gonna free you up. It's okay to fall asleep while you're praying. For years, I thought God would be so disappointed, right? When people fell asleep, it's like, because I was thinking about Jesus and his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, those guys were knuckleheads anyway, right? They couldn't stay awake. So Jesus kind of had to, you know, slap him in the back of the head. That's me kind of paraphrasing, but that's kind of what happened there. That's a whole different story. But God's your creator. If you're talking to him and that's the last thing you do before you fall asleep, I, I just don't think he's upset with you. I can remember when Sam was born, he's our oldest. And I can remember when I would be at night holding him. And you know, if you ever had a baby, y'all know how this is as parents. And those little eyes, and they start looking at you. And then they kind of start rolling back in the back of their head. And they're fighting it so hard, they don't want to fall asleep. And eventually those little eyes close and they're asleep. And then that's the crucial point where you've got to carry them right to the bed and make sure you don't wake them back up while you sit them down. Okay, that's hard to do. I remember the first time I saw that, I wondered, is that how God feels about me when I fall asleep praying? And it just freed me up. Like if I'm one of his children, I'm just gonna pray at night. And if I fall asleep, I think he'll be okay with it. I want you to learn from each other. I want you to encourage one another. I want you to see what other people do in their prayer life and incorporate the practices that you feel comfortable with. And I want you to give yourself permission to experiment. But I also wanna challenge you, don't try to emulate someone else, okay? Be you. If you try to emulate someone else, it can backfire a little bit. So this happened to me years ago. Um, I worked for an incredible man of God named Dr. Elmer Towns. He was the co-founder of Liberty University. It's the largest Christian university in the world. Co-founded that university in 1971. Uh, we were there for a few years. I was in seminary and my wife was finishing up her undergrad degree. So this has been about 20 years ago and I was working for him as his graduate assistant. Now he's 90 now and he has more energy than I do and we're gonna bring him here to preach on a Sunday. Y'all gonna love him. He's fantastic, okay? But this is about 20 years ago and from time to time, he would go speak at conferences or different churches or whatever and I would drive him there and we'd get to spend some time together. So on this particular trip, that night before we kind of went back to the hotel, he was like, hey, let's spend some time praying together. And I'm thinking like, awesome, because he's like this prayer warrior and this is incredible. And so we got down on our knees and we started to pray. And he went first. And that was a problem, okay? Because he proceeded for about the next 20 to 25 minutes to pray about everything you could possibly pray for. Any global issue that was happening, he prayed for it. He prayed for Morgan and I. He prayed for the future of our marriage. He prayed for our future children. He prayed for their future spouses, he prayed for everything going on. And about halfway through his prayer, I began to think to myself, I must have misunderstood him. <laughs> when he said, let's pray, I think he was saying he'll pray and I'm just kind of here to participate because if I have to pray, this is not good because there's nothing left to pray for. And surely <laughs> he finishes and he says, amen. And I open my eyes and I start to pop back up off my knees. He did not move. And I realized it's my turn. I prayed without a doubt the worst prayer that has ever been prayed, right? <laughs> and I'm sure he even wondered, does this young man even walk with Jesus, right? No, he didn't because he's kind and he's gracious, he's wonderful. But what happened in that moment was I was praying with a prayer warrior and I kind of got a little insecure about my own prayer life, okay? Now, over the next few years, he helped me kind of grow and cultivate a prayer life. And so it's good to look to people who you think, man, that's someone who I really wanna model my walk with the Lord after. But be careful, because if you try to emulate that, sometimes the enemy can begin to use that against us, all right? But I wanna give you permission to experiment in your prayer life. Here we go, fourth point, last application. Be specific in your requests. I wanna challenge you and encourage you you wanna pray bold prayers. What makes a bold prayer a bold prayer is how specific you are. Don't be afraid to be specific. 
I want to free you up in this series to recognize you can actually ask something from God for you. Some of you love to ask of God for your kids or for your grandkids or for your spouse, but you really struggle when it comes to asking God for things from you. And I wanna encourage you to do that. And I wanna challenge you to be specific. And, and here's what's important to remember. When you ask God for something specific, he always answers that prayer. Someone says, well, God just didn't answer that prayer. No, he answered that prayer. Dr. Ike Riker taught me this years ago, first pastor I ever worked for, that when you pray, you might even wanna jot these down somewhere. This is super helpful. That when you pray, God answers your specific prayers one of four ways. Sometimes God says, go. That's the yes. You pray and you sense through reading his word and through the Holy Spirit and through the counsel you receive from other brothers and sisters in Christ that God is giving you the go ahead. That's the answer that we love to hear. Sometimes God says, slow. You're asking the right thing, it's just in the wrong time. You're tracking with God, it's just not the right season. And for God to answer the right prayer at the wrong time would actually not be fruitful. So sometimes God says, slow. Sometimes God says, grow. You're actually not ready for what you're asking of him. He wants to answer that prayer, but there's a depth of character or spiritual maturity that he still needs to build in us before he answers that prayer the way we're asking it of him. That's not necessarily the answer we want to hear sometimes, but it's a helpful answer. And then church, sometimes the fourth answer, God says no. Sometimes in his wisdom and in his sovereignty, he knows that what we are asking of him is actually not what we need. It's not for our good, it's not for his glory. And when God says no to a prayer that we ask of him, we have to trust him. It stretches our faith. Do we trust the heart of God? But I wanna challenge you to be specific in your request. Look at the encouragement that Jesus gives us in doing this, Matthew chapter seven. Jesus says, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask of him? God wants to give you good gifts. God wants to answer your bold prayers. But you've gotta be specific in your request. I remember when I learned this lesson, it changed the trajectory of my life. I was 13 years old. I was a middle school student, seventh grade, at Autry Middle School in Kennesaw, Georgia. Now, if you ever get a chance to go to Autry Middle School in Kennesaw, Georgia, don't, okay? Just don't. There's nothing special about it at all. It's just where I happen to go to middle school. And like most middle school kids, you know, school was something I had to do. It wasn't really something I liked to do. I was a lot more into sports and things like that. But on this particular day, as a 13-year-old seventh grader, Miss Inslee, my science teacher, which for a second, God bless middle school science teachers, right? It's about the patience of Job, my goodness, right? So my science teacher makes this announcement that there's gonna be an essay writing contest. I didn't pay attention to that announcement. She then said that this essay writing contest was going to be for one winner from our entire school district. And so y'all know like in the triangle, we got all these different school districts, same thing in Metro Atlanta, there are all these different school districts. They're gonna choose one middle school student to win an essay writing contest from our entire district. And she said, and the winner, if you win the essay writing contest, is you get to go to space camp in Huntsville, Alabama for a week. Well, now she had my attention. Because I'm thinking, I've never thought about going to space camp, but that sounds kind of cool. She says, you'll get to fly on a plane. Now, it's a 22-minute flight from Atlanta to Huntsville, right? But I still kind of thought that was pretty cool. But then she really got my attention when she said this. She said, all of the science teachers, we've met with the principal, and our principal has agreed that if the winner from our entire district is chosen from our school, that student won't have to make up any of the work while they're at space camp. Now she had my attention, right? <laughs> I'm like, I can go to space camp, I can fly on a plane without my parents, and I don't have to make up any of the work, I'm in. So I go home and I tell my parents about this grandiose idea that I'm gonna enter into an essay writing contest so I can go to space camp. Never cared about being an astronaut, I just wanna enter into this, right? And my parents have heard me make these grand you know, proclamations before, so they kinda listened and nodded, but then they realized about two or three days later, I was not letting this one go. Like, I was serious about it, and I decided to write my essay on lasers. 
because that's what my dad did. My dad had his own business where he designed and manufactured and installed and trained people on how to work with lasers. And I was really fascinated by it because it was what my dad did. And I was really bothered by it because he never let me play with the lasers, which was probably good because they'll burn things down. If you know that about lasers. Anyway, that's near here or there. I decided I'm gonna do my essay on lasers. I went to a library. I used an ancient book called an encyclopedia to do research <laughs> for my essay. And I wrote this essay and I'm working on this essay and, and my parents can start to tell like, he's actually kind of cares about this. And so one afternoon after school, I'm talking about my essay and I'm working on it to do like in a couple of days. And my mom looks at me and she says, Adam, have you prayed about this? And I said, no, I didn't know you could pray about going to space camp. I thought you just prayed for missionaries and when the church needed more money. Those are basically what I heard. <laughs> at my church that we were supposed to pray about. Like, I didn't know you could pray about space camp. And she says, is it important to you? I said, yeah. She said, well, then it's important to God. She said, Adam, anytime something matters to you, it matters to God. You should talk to him about this. Some of the best guidance I've ever received in my life. And so I turned in my little essay and then for the next few weeks while we waited to see who won, I got on my knees every single night and I prayed a really basic prayer God, help me win the essay writing contest so I can go to space camp. It was pretty simple, but it was specific. It came from a 13-year-old kid. And guess what? I won that essay writing contest. I won. Not because I'm a great essay writer, but because God chose to get involved in the details of a 13-year-old kid's life. I got to fly on that plane all by myself without my parents for 22 minutes to go to space camp, all right? Now, when I got to space camp, I learned a really important lesson. See, there's smart, and then there is space camp smart. Those are two totally different things, okay? All of the other kids at space camp weren't there because they wrote an essay and prayed to God. They were there because they really wanted to become astronauts, okay? Which made me the dumbest kid at space camp, all right? <laughs> No doubt. We were broken up into teams and we had these competitions the whole week. Like, you know, there were missions, simulated missions, and they were super important. I was just there having fun. And um, I literally caused our team to lose both of the missions. <laughs> One of the missions, I was the weather guy. I gave the go ahead to launch the shuttle when there was a hurricane off the coast of Florida. All right. <laughs> I kind of missed that on the radar. I was just excited to say go, you know, get all the little movies, right? And then on the other mission, I was doing experiments and we had to like, you know, keep track of all this stuff. And I, I, I was supposed to push a button and this chair spin around and I misread the instructions and I let the chair spin for way too long. And the poor girl in the chair, she started throwing up. Like, I'm not kidding, right? <laughs> I literally messed it up that badly, all right? But let me tell you the good that happened at space camp. My youth pastor had started challenging us that year. We met at McDonald's every Wednesday morning and we would read our Bible together. And he was challenging us to read our Bibles on our own. And so I, I, I was trying to do this the best I knew how. And, and he had committed, he, he made us commit, do this every day. So I was really trying hard. But I'm at space camp, like, I just can't read my Bible in front of their kids. And so I waited, I was kind of like this bunkhouse, all these dudes, they go out for like rec time. And so now's my chance to read my Bible with no one around. So I'm like, read my Bible. And they, they came back inside and they saw me reading my Bible. And it, it, I kind of freaked out. And one of them said, hey, what are you doing? And I said, I'm reading my Bible. And he looked at me and he goes, that's cool. And they walked back outside. And the best way my 13 year old little mind could understand God speaking to me, here's what I heard God say that day. You can walk with me and still have friends. You can be a light in your school and still have friends. And church, what I would tell you, is that experience, it put me on a trajectory over 30 years ago. Have I been perfect? No, of course not. But I've never left that trajectory. And here's why. See, God gave me a space camp story. No one has ever had to tell me from the time I was 13 years old, you need to pray for that. Because as a 13 year old kid, I saw God get himself involved in the details of my life and answer a very specific prayer. So here is my hope and my goal for you. If you don't have one yet, I hope by the end of this year, God gives you a space camp story. But you gotta ask him. 
You've gotta be specific. You've gotta have the faith to call on his name and say, God, by all human understanding, I don't see how this could happen. But I'm gonna call on you. And can I tell you what you need along the way, church? You need his people. When we talk about this house, and we talk about these people, and we talk about our great God, here's what we're reminded of. We're all in this together. You struggle praying those prayers. We all know what that feels like. Have I still struggled with praying those prayers over the years, even with a story like that? Absolutely. It's why we need each other. That's why you need to be a part of this series so you can see God move in your life. Would you bow your head with me this morning? And so God, we thank you just for your goodness. We thank you that with everything happening all over this world, that you would actually take the time to welcome the prayers of your children, hang them up on your wall, savor our words. God, for some of us today, we need to get a little more specific. We need to actually call on you. We need to demonstrate a little bit of faith. So God, as we worship you together as one body, as one people, as one family in this house, God, would you speak to your children as only a loving father can. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, kind of invite you to stand as we sing together this morning. <clears throat> Well, church, we're gonna sing this new song, which is the title song from the live recording we're gonna do on the 18th. Come on. Whatever you've been through, whatever you face, whatever you've done, this is your place. To lay down your burdens and worship the name That rescues the weary and holds all your shame. This firm foundation, this holy ground, it shakes you up and it holds you down. This house is for you to cast out those demons for you, crying and screaming for you. Yeah. 
Scouts 